Okay, so <clears throat> finally we have for material in which every plane is a plane of symmetry. We call that material isotropic. <coughs> and with that, our C matrix is greatly simplified. And now I'm just going to remove the generic C11s and write in some actual terms for the constant. So with an isotropic material, we can uniquely define the strength, you know, the material properties with two constants. Lambda and mu. Ah. I'll just write out the whole equation here. sure I'm consistent. Okay. So that's what we have for an isotropic material. We just need two constants. Now these are probably not the ones you're familiar with. Um, there's a lot of other, these, these are called Lemay's constants. So lambda is Lemay's first constant and mu is Lemay's second constant, but it's also mu is actually identical to the shear modulus. So you can actually relate these two constants to many other sort of more familiar constants. Uh, and they ha So let me just write down the identities and then we'll talk about a little bit about kind of what, what they mean. So G.
Okay. So <clears throat> these are just all identities. And the idea is that if you know any two constants, you can derive any of the other relationships, right? And Wikipedia actually has a really nice table. They have this, this same kind of information in ta tabular form. So say you know E and U, and you want to find lambda, right? And you, or, yeah. So if you know E and U, and you want to find lambda, that you'd use this equation. Like I said, Wikipedia has a, t a nice table. But let's talk about what some of these are, and I'll write down the names for them. But again, lambda is LeMay's first constant, <coughs> and mu is LeMay's second constant, but it's also equal to the shear modulus. So the shear modulus is a material's resistance to shear deformation. Right? Uh, e is a Young's modulus. That's probably the one you're most familiar with, right? That's your sort of undergraduate solid mechanics deformation. So this is the material's resistance to planar elongation, right? And a lot of times that's called the stiffness or the modulus of elasticity. So K is a measure of the material's strength in volumetric compression, right? So if I, if I take a material and I squeeze it on all sides, that's, that's what K uh, is a, you know, a resistance of. And um, is that all of them? And then new is the Poisson ratio. So that's a basically, it's sort of a secondary parameter, but it's basically how much a material will contract when you pull on it, right? And so it's usually expressed, it's unitless as a percentage. So a, a, a typical material, engineering material, might have somewhere in the like 20 to 30 percent range. And so what that means is that if I pull on it, it contracts by 20 percent elastic. Okay, so again then, lambda is LeMay's constant. K is the bulk modulus. <coughs> e is Young's modulus. also called the modulus of elasticity. News Poisson ratio. And what am I missing? Oh. These two are both the shear modulus. So another way to write this, much more compactly, for the isotropic material, going back to the fourth order tensor that we saw in our generalized Hooke's law, we can write that C i j k l is equal to lambda delta i j delta KL plus mu delta IJ delta JL plus delta IL JK. And so then if we substitute that in to the generalized Hooke's law, So again, I'm just going to plug in that Cij into this equation, right? And I'll write it out again. So then if I distribute this, this epsilon KL, right, through all the terms, 
uh, this this really reduces because if I if I say l let's look at just the multiplication of sigma j k times sigma k l right so I think I showed you guys that anytime you have a Kronecker delta f function with you know multiplied by something like this then you can just pass over the repeated indices right so then that this would equal sigma j l right so just pass over the repeated indice so i have sigma j l now let's add in this this term you know multiplied by sigma i l right so then that's again now i have i l j l passing over the the repeated l i have J I. Yeah. And so anyway, if you if you work out through the rest of those, what this reduces to sigma i j epsilon k k plus two mu epsilon i j. So this is Hooke's law for an isotropic material written in indicial notation. And it's quite compact. Right? So if we let, just to write it a different way, if we let i equal to j, then we get sigma i i is equal to 3 lambda plus 2 mu epsilon i i. And of course, then we can invert this, so we have epsilon i i. And so then, you know, anytime you have a re repeated indice, they're called dummy indices, just like a dummy variable in, the, in integration, right? You can, you can replace it with anything. So. The fact that this is sigma ii I is not significant. I could, it's the same thing as just replacing it with sigma kk, right? So I can rewrite this if you don't like my sigma ii I. I can write this sigma kk, right? Then I plug it in there. So I plug it in there. Now I have everything. Then I can solve for sigma ij in terms of the stress. So I can solve for the strain in terms of the stress. And with that, oh, I'm also going to use these two relationships, the fact that lambda is So these were just, they were on the previous page. I'm just writing out the ones I'm using. Right. So if I sol plug that in and solve for epsilon ij using these relationships, then I get So this is the same thing, it's just inverted. So it's written the, st <coughs> the strains in terms of the stresses. And sometimes that can be useful. So on the next page, I'm just going to write out the individual components of this guy. Okay.
So I, I just wrote out the components of that. And for the shear terms, just use the more compact. So it, you know, it, I'm using three constants here, E, nu, and the shear modulus, right? But they're all related, so it's really just two constants. It just, this is probably the most compact way you can write it out. And so you, you may have seen this, actually, this form, and uh, depending on how far you went in your undergraduate solid mechanics, right? But, you know, now it should be really clear, like, say, just take this in the 1D case, right? If we look at this equation, in the 1D case, there's no sigma 2, 2, or 3, 3, and you just have epsilon equals sigma over E or sigma equals E epsilon, right? So that's our sort of undergraduate constitutive law. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. 